Um, thanks so much for inviting me to do this. I uh, love this series and I feel totally honored um, to get to uh, present some of my work here. Um, and so uh, I have, uh, you know, it's been a sort of crazy time. I can't promise that my five-year-old won't run through the room as I'm giving this talk. I, I think she's gonna be held at bay, um, but we'll see how it goes. Um, so I couldn't come up with like a catchy title. So I came up with this really long, um, a mouthful of a title uh, that describes the work that I want to talk about today, which is um, Bridging Cognitive and Neural Theories of Reading and Its Recovery Using Representational Similarity Analysis. Um, and so I'll unpack what that means as we go through uh, different portions of this talk. Okay, so I want to talk today mostly about reading. At the very end, I'm going to pop up to talk about how these methods um, can be useful for thinking about other aspects of language processing. But for the most part, um, I'm gonna be interested in thinking about reading in the brain and how this technique that I'm gonna talk about today, representational similarity analysis, can provide some really unique insights into thinking about reading in the brain and also particularly for this audience, the recovery of reading in the brain in individuals um, who have had strokes and lost the ability to read and then uh, at least partially recovered that ability. And so when we think about reading, it's worth sort of thinking about at a very basic level what we're talking about. And so we're talking about, um, for most humans, I do some work also on how we how blind individuals read Braille. And so it's not true that for everybody, reading happens through the visual modality, but for most people, reading is the processes involved in mapping from a visual input onto a phonological uh, representation of the pronunciation of that word and to a semantic representation of that word's meaning. Reading is a really interesting thing um, to study for me for a lot of reasons. And so one is that um, as with many language tasks, it involves transformation through a bunch of really different kinds of representational spaces. So it, it involves uh, integrating you know, communication between the systems involved in vision and also the systems involved in meaning and the, the other aspects of the language uh, production system and language comprehension system. Um, and so thinking about how information kind of transforms as it moves through that system is one reason that I think studying reading is really interesting. Um, I also think it's really interesting because unlike say uh, spoken language, uh, written language isn't something that we evolved for. Um, so written language is something that's only a couple thousand years old. Um, and so whatever sort of neural correlates we're able to identify as being critical for our ability to read, they're reflecting something about how our brains are capable of learning these culturally passed on skills rather than sort of these evolu the evolutionary history of, of language in the brain. And so those are some kind of high level uh, reasons why I tend to be really interested in reading and writing. Um, but I'm also interested in it from the perspective of, of, of stroke and recovery from stroke, both from sort of the academic, sort of the more kind of like theoretical, not helping people side of things, but also um, because reading is actually a really important skill and it's something that uh, frequently gets lost in individuals who have aphasia. And so brain lesions can lead to impairments in reading. Sometimes these impairments can be really selective, like individuals who have alexia without agraphia, where they seem to have um, difficulties in, say, recognizing letters or being able to map visual forms onto familiar letters, but not problems in writing or problems with other aspects of language or even problems with other kinds of visual experiences. Um, more often, you actually see that reading is one of many different types of symptoms that come out after somebody has a, a language that affects their language network. And so you see that, that reading is another skill, another language skill that's been affected. And um, I think it's really important to point out that especially in our kind of modern world and maybe like especially today as we're all kind of stuck in our houses all around the world, um, reading is not the sort of secondary language skill, but rather reading the ability to kind of process the written word is one of the primary ways that we go about engaging with language in our daily lives. And indeed you see this with people with aphasia where when people have, people who with aphasia, when they have reading limitations, they talk about the way that it creates this major impact on their ability to participate in life around them. And frequently they talk about how recovering reading is one of their primary goals for what they wanna get out of some type of, of, of therapy for their, for, their, uh, for their underlying impairments. And so it's really important to kind of think about how reading works in the brain, how it gets damaged and how it recovers in these individuals who survive strokes. 
Okay, so um, to do that and how we might sort of be able to think about how we can study how reading is organized in the brain and how reading is sort of works in general, there's been sort of tons and tons of research that have focused on this. But in fact, the research that's focused on this has done so in uh, sort of two pretty separate lines of inquiry. And so one line of inquiry has been pretty strictly a cognitive theory of reading that doesn't make much reference to anything about the neural processes involved in reading, but rather is really interested in how do you do these mappings that involve you going from a visual input onto a phonological representation into a semantic representation. It talks about what transformations are available, so an orthographic representation that maybe mediates your ability to go from vision to phonology or vision to semantics, which types of, you know, what are the pathways that people typically take as they go through reading? This is a toy cognitive theory of reading. In fact, uh, cognitive theorists of reading will frequently create something that looks more like this, where you have a large series of levels of representation and processes that break down kind of the independent contributions of sort of first you start with features, then you detect shapes, then you detect sort of knowledge of which shapes correspond to letters or allographic level, then you map onto some abstract knowledge about which, you know, what the meaning is of those allographs, and then you start these processes that involve mapping to phonology and mapping to meaning. And so this is the kind of thing that a cognitive scientist of reading might build, frequently using, for example, the single case studies of people who've lost the ability to do processing at each of these levels. And so their underlying reading problem can be attributed to problems at each of these different, can, might be attributed to problems at one of these different levels of representation. So that's one approach that happens within this cognitive uh, level. Another approach that happens within this sort of cognitive level of theorizing is the construction of like a, an enormous number of cognitive models, co computationally explicit models of exactly what the computations are that allow you to go between these levels. And so here I'm just focusing on going between the level of abstract letter identity representations and mapping onto an orthographic lexicon, your knowledge about which strings of letters are familiar words. And so here is a model by uh, Dennis Norris and, uh, and Kinoshita from 2012. That's one model of how you do that process that uses Bayesian computations. In fact, there's many, many different models of exactly how you do only this one tiny piece of the, of the reading system. And when you look at the cognitive literature, um, you see that what, what people are debating are the sort of details of these different cognitive models of the types of computations that are involved in being able to do, say, a specific mapping within, within this system. And so that's what a cognitive theory of reading looks like, and that's how it's sort of developed over time. And so the goals of these cognitive theories of readings are their theories of the underlying computations. What are the computations that allow us to go from visual input to phonology and semantics? What are the levels of representation? How is information structured at each of those levels? What are the processes by which we're able to do this mapping? And so independently, of, largely independently of this, there's been another sort of line of work that's gone on for a very long time that's been super interesting, that's been really interested in the neural theories of how we read. So how do we, what are the brain parts that are involved in being able to do this mapping from visual input onto phonology and onto semantics? And so you identify the regions that show activation to written words, and so you can see what parts of the brain show an increase in bold response when uh, when people are looking at familiar words compared to string consonant strings or maybe other types of visual objects or other comparisons that you might look at. You can also look at sort of where in the brain does damage correspond to reading impairments. And so if you have damage to this um, little chunk of cortex on the left ventro-occipital uh, uh, lobe, you are likely to end up with this kind of alexia without agraphia pattern. Um, and so you can try to map sort of what parts of the brain are really critical for our ability to do reading. And so the goals of these theories are something more like, can we identify the brain mechanisms that underlie our ability to understand and read aloud words? And these two lines of uh, research um, have been doing really good and really important work for a long time, but they've been um, sort of progressing in ways that are um, surprisingly independent of each other, where the insights from one are not informing the insights from the, or the, the, the research in the other. And so from a cognitive perspective, you definitely see that people are, uh, will, will sort of explicitly say that they're 
not particularly interested in how neural data can inform these theories because I just don't think the neural data is at a point where it can actually inform these competing cognitive theories of how we do this reading process. And from the neural perspective, they think the details that people are going at in terms of these cognitive theories are just not appropriate for sort of what we're actually looking for when we're looking at reading in the brain. And so what I want to talk about today are, is a technique that I think is really useful um, for being able to actually bridge these two approaches to thinking about uh, how humans are able to read. And so techniques that allow us to map the neural substrates of components of cognitive theory. So not just reading in the brain, but what part of the brain is responsible for orthographic processing? What part of the brain is responsible for the visual aspects of reading? Where is sort of the phonological aspects of reading being computed? All of those things are how we might map from one of these cognitive theories onto sort of neural structures. And as a sort of corollary of that, what we can also think about doing is how we can not just map the organization of reading in the brain, but maybe how we can map the reorganization of the components of cognitive theories following brain damage. And so if you have brain damage that from a cognitive perspective appears to wipe out, say, your ability to process abstract letter identities, and from a neural perspective seems to wipe out, say, this left ventral occipital temporal lobe, and then you recover, then you regain the ability to read to some extent, how has that level of abstract letter identity sort of shifted to now being processed in a different part of the brain? I also think what's really interesting about this technique and what I'm excited about, though I'm not really going to have a chance to talk about today, is how you can also go the opposite way. So you can start to now use neural data to distinguish between competing cognitive theories, where you can test sort of predictions of different cognitive theories now using data from the brain and not just data from behavior, either with patients or with um, hungover undergraduates, but rather um, you can now start to use neural data that, that might be able to help, help address some of these cognitive questions. Um, I'm not gonna focus on that in the talk today. I'm gonna end a little bit with some projects that we're doing, just really brief descriptions of some projects that we're doing that are trying to, to get at, at this, this approach as well. Okay, and so uh, the technique that I'm going to talk about that's going to allow us to do this mapping, this neural, this cognitive to neural and neural to cognitive mapping, is a technique that's now people I, I imagine are probably familiar with. It's an imaging technique that's called representational similarity analysis that was first introduced by Nico Krikoskorte when he was at the NIH um, like 12 years ago. And so uh, the way that this uh, now, this what's what's nice about representational similarity analysis is it provides a tool where you can come up with sort of a space of analysis that is uh, isomorphic, that's complementary across a cognitive theory perspective, a neuroimaging data perspective, and a behavioral experiment perspective. And so you can start to think about how you can bridge these different modes of thinking about cognitive neuroscience more broadly. And so how is this going to work in the context of reading? And so I'm going to show you a really, really toy architecture, um, cognitive architecture of reading, um, just to illustrate how this works. And so this is going to be something that starts with a visual input, then there's going to be an orthographic level, then a semantics level, then a phonology level, then spoken output. Uh, ignore details about where the arrows are and what I think the mapping processes are. It's not that important for this example. Um, that I'm going to go through. And so um, we can start with these sort of labels on boxes, but what those labels on boxes really mean is that we have some underlying assumption about what the, the representations are, what the units are at each of these levels. And so at the orthographic level, we have representations of letters in their order. At a, at a phonological level, we have representations of phonemes in their order. And at a semantic level, we have something here I put, you know, uh, features, semantic features, maybe semantic features are the right way to think about what the representations are at this level. And so when you go to read a word, you activate representations at each of these levels corresponding to what that word is. So when you're reading the word do, you activate the letters that are in do, you activate its sort of meaning, you activate its pronunciation. Now, if you go to read a different word, you'll see that different words will uh, activate similar patterns depending on which level you are in the system. So the word tough, for example, activates a lot of the same units at an orthographic level of representation. And so it's pretty similar to the, pa the pattern across the level of orthographic representation is pretty similar between do and tough, but it, it activates a really different semantic representation and a really different phonological representation. And so 
we can then say there's high similarity between doe and tuff at an orthographic level but lower similarity at a semantic level and a phonological level now a different word like bread might have high similarity to doe at a semantic level they might mean similar things but have different representation different amounts of similar low similarity at an orthographic or a phonological level and just to fill out this whole pattern something like so is going to have a lot of overlap at a phonological level but much less overlap at either a semantic or an orthographic level and so these levels of representation can be distinguished from each other on the basis of which words are treated as being similar and so similarity from a cognitive theory perspective now operates as a tool for being able to think about what are the representations at these levels. You can use theories to sort of develop um, uh, develop sort of models of how similar each item should be to every other item um, at, at these different levels of representation. Okay, so um, this idea that theories differ in terms of what counts as similar to each other at these different levels of representation is actually something that we use all the time in cognitive psychology and cognitive neuropsychology. So behavioral reading experiments often depend on similarity. So priming experiments, when you're looking at um, whether this word primes this other word, priming is about these two words being similar to each other at a level that you're trying to probe. They're similar to each other orthographically, semantically, or phonologically, depending on what you're studying. Also, when we look at the error corpora produced by individuals um, with aphasia following stroke, we're often classifying those errors based on their relationship to the target, again, using sort of similarity, saying, oh, these two things are, this patient made a lot of errors where it seems like the error is semantically related to the target. They're semantically similar to the target. This one, this patient made one where the errors are phonologically similar to the target. We're using that now as a tool to really understand the different levels that are involved. Um, in, in language processing. So similarity is a tool that we all should be very familiar in using. Also, when you look at how people have been trying to um, adjudicate between competing cognitive theories, these computationally explicit cognitive theories of, of reading, it, in fact, they've sort of explicitly identified cases in which one theory says these words are similar and another theory says these other words are similar and so and then tries to design experiments around this notion of similarity to be able to adjudicate between these cognitive theories and so really all we're doing with this approach is saying that the same similarity logic can be applied to neuroimaging experiments which will allow us to to use similarity as a tool to 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 link to to cognitive theory neurosimilarity in brain brain yeah, similarity in regions of the brain now can be used as a tool to link to cognitive theory. Okay, so I'm going to first talk about an experiment that we did, um, just an example of an experiment that we did with um, some healthy undergraduates to kind of show the benefit of using this technique and how, what it can start to teach us about um, understanding uh, the cognitive function that underlies these different regions that we see activated. Um, in the context of reading experiments. And then I'm gonna talk about um, the work that we've done in reorganization, which at this point is still a single case study. We have a, an IH grant to look at a larger sample. We've actually collected a lot of data and are plugging through it right now. I was hoping that we'd have more data to present um, for this talk, but we just, you know, the world has gone crazy. And so we just don't, we don't have it done yet, but it will be soon, so stay tuned for that. Okay, so this is gonna be the experiment with just healthy undergraduates. Um, and so the way this works is we have um, undergraduates just lying in the scanner. They're presented 35 words, one at a time, with a fairly slow, you know, every, I guess it's every two seconds with an occasional pause um, where there's like a two, you know, a two second period where there's no word that's actually presented. Embedded within those 35 words, there's also five proper names. And the task is just to press a button whenever you see a proper name. You know, go in retrospect, I'm not sure this is the most compelling task. It's something that um, I used when I was a postdoc uh, working in, in an ERP experiment. And so I thought that it would port over well. I think it's still a sort of a reasonable task because I think thinking about whether a word that you're seeing is a proper name requires some amount of engagement, semantic engagement with what those words actually mean rather than just passively viewing those words. And so um, this. This sort of is repeated. Each run is repeated. We, we have this happen in each run. 
and this gets repeated uh, 12 different times. So we get pretty good um, uh, a pretty good measure of what the pattern of activity is, not for words in general, but for each of our individual 35 words, because that's what we're going to need to do our RSA exam. And then the words have to be selected really carefully. And so in the original Krigaskorte um, study, they talk about how the benefit of this approach is that it's kind of like no experimental design, it's condition rich, you just throw a bunch of stimuli and you see what comes out. That has not been our experience with running RSA experiments with language, especially when we wanna to try to do things like distinguish orthographic and phonological processing, because in English, words that are spelled similarly typically are also pronounced the same way. Um, we've switched to doing some of our more recent experiments using um, Chinese in part because um, there's a there's a more opaque mapping between between the orthographic and the and the phonological representations in Chinese, though other issues come up as well. And so the picking of these sort of words that we were going to use was actually the really hard part of this experiment. I'm not sure we did the best possible job, but in general, we tried to select these words so that they were distinguishing between orthographic, phonological, and semantic similarity in the way that my dough compared to tough bread and so were sort of that 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 grouping kind of distinguishes between these different levels of representation. Okay, so people are lying in the scanner, they're doing this task. Um, before they go in the scanner, we take those same 35 words and we take cognitive theories of how information is being processed at each of these different levels of representation and we, you, we compute how similar these words should be to each other at each of these different levels of representation. So what I'm showing here is visual similarity, which is in this paper was just a voxel, a y, or sorry, a pixel wise overlap, um, where you just put the words on top of each other and you just count how similar they are in terms of where there are dark spots and where there are light spots. We've since tried other measures of visual similarity. This one seems to kind of work the best um, in terms of modeling what we're, what we're looking at. We also then took uh, a theory of orthographic representation. For those of you who are interested in sort of the idiosyncrasies of what people debate about in terms of um, computational models of, of reading, we took a bigram theory, an open bigram theory, um, in part because there was existing work on um, what people thought the representations would be in some of the regions that we were interested in. So Stan Dehane has a proposal that says, there are bigram representations in the part of the brain that we were really planning on targeting. We also did the same thing for phonological similarity and semantic similarity. So what's being shown in each of these colorful plots is the similarity of each word to every other word. So the off diagonal where red means they're very similar to each other and blue means they're very dissimilar to each other. And there's no way that you can look closely enough to kind of see what the labels are what you're just supposed to see is that these things are not, they're, they're sort of different patterns of similarity depending on, on which level you're looking at. Okay, and so then we, um, so we wanna use this now as a tool for mapping from cognitive theory onto neural processes. And so there's really general agreement about what the nodes are in the reading network. We sort of know that um, the visual word form area seems to play a real role in um, reading. Uh, but we, there's debate over what the cognitive function is of each of those regions. And so we can use this tool now to kind of adjudicate between these debates. And so quickly to, to look at the methods, for each participant, we identify the pattern of brain activity associated not with reading in general, but for each individual word. So what does the pattern look like for ankle? What does the pattern look like for yacht? We then, uh, for each participant within an ROI, a region of interest, we get that pattern of activity across the voxels in that ROI, and then we correlate that pattern for each, with each of each word to every other word. So what we've created is a brain-based similarity metric of how similar this region of the brain is treating all the words to all the other words. It's now in the same space as our similarity metrics that we've developed for our computational theories, from our computational theories. Then we just, because they're in the sort of same dimensionality, we can just correlate the brain-based and the theoretical matrices. And so we can look at how similar this pattern is that we get in this region to our visual metric and how similar it is to our orthographic metric. 
And then we just do some inferential statistics across participants to see whether this region cares more about orthographic similarity or visual similarity or one of the other things that we're considering. Okay, so the first area that we focused on was the visual word form area, because as I said, people have generally agreed that this region is involved somehow in reading, but debate vigorously what the function is of this reading. What is the cognitive process that's being carried out in the course of reading. So it's very clear that the visual word form area activates in response to uh, words more than say consonant strings or other visually matched stimuli. It's pretty clear that when you lose this part of the brain, you develop um, reading impairments. Um, that has led to Han and Cohen to argue that this, the neural representations in this region are specialized for orthographic processing, that this is sort of the brain's letterbox, and it's where we get those orthographic representations. So that's a claim about a specific cognitive module. Um, whereas Price and Devlin have argued that that's not the right way to think about it, that instead, the reason you get activation in this task is that it's a region that's sort of generally involved in processing visual information, but you get top-down modulation of this region when that visual information has corresponding kind of meaning and name information. And so the fact that written words can activate a meaning and also can activate a pronunciation, you get then top-down modulation, which leads to increased activity. And so there's a clear question here, you know, there's a disagreement that hasn't been really resolved about what the function of this region is. And, but there's a clear question, which is, is the BWFA an orthographic region or is it a visual processing region with top-down phonological and semantic influences? And so we can look at our visual word form area ROI. We can take it, we can warp it into each subject's native space, and then we can compute the similarities. And so that's what's being shown. What's being shown in the graph here are the, um, the, the ROIs for the visual word form area and then the right hemisphere homolog. And then the graph is showing within those ROIs, how, what's the similarity index? What's the RSA value? What's the sort of, what's the correspondence between the brain-based similarity metric and our visual, orthographic, phonological, and semantic metrics. And so what comes out is really interesting. And so for the right hemisphere, you see a significant correlation with our visual similarity metric, but none of the other ways of thinking about how words might be related to each other. So it seems like the right hemisphere homologue of the VWFA is just doing kind of low level visual processing of what these stimuli look like. In contrast, you don't see visual processing in the left visual word form area. Instead, you see orthographic processing and to some extent, semantic processing. The semantic effects are also uh, significantly above, uh, above, above zero. And when we um, try to look within the ROI that we've developed to see if there's sort of separate subregions that are involved in orthographic processing and semantic processing, we're unable to do that, at least at the level of granularity at which we can carry out these analyses. It seems like this part of the brain is sort of doing both orthographic and semantic level information processing. And so in part, this seems to have some patterns that are consistent with the visual word form area hypothesis. We show left lateralization of orthographic processing, which is distinct from the right hemisphere, which seems to be doing visual processing, which is part of what's been proposed by Beta Han and Cohen. But we also see some patterns that seem to be consistent with the Price and Devlin hypothesis, specifically the semantic influence on the visual word form area. And this is in fact, from a cognitive perspective, kind of exactly what you would expect from an interactive activation theory of reading. So we could say that this is a level of orthographic processing, but information is flowing up from this level of processing to a semantic level, which then is feeding back down to this orthographic level, which is creating sort of representations that are influenced both by orthographic processing, but also by semantic processing. And so that's sort of where we stand right now. We're doing a couple of things to follow up on this. And so one is we're trying to do RSA with um, hot, uh, with data that has high temporal resolution, even if it doesn't have as high spatial resolution, to see if we can say, um, see that the orthographic similarity is coming on first, followed soon by the semantic similarity. And then the other thing we're doing is we're actually now using interactive activation theories to look at how these similarity matrices are evolving over time at these different levels of representation to kind of push this work forward. We also looked at the angular gyrus, which has received less um, 
uh, work, uh, less attention from the kind of cognitive neuroimaging literature, but actually from a neuropsychological perspective, there's a long history of thinking about this region as maybe um, being critical for orthographic representations going back now over a hundred years. And so there was, you know, before people thought that the visual word form area was the brain's letterbox, people thought that the, the angular gyrus was the brain's letterbox, that it contained the orthographic representations that we need for reading and writing, because when you have damage here, a lot of patients have uh, alexia with agraphia. However, the cognitive neuroimaging literature has not found evidence for orthographic processing. So there's specifically this region has been argued to be involved in the brain semantic, sort of general semantic network that gets used across lots of tasks. Though in this meta-analysis, that's where you know, this highly cited meta-analysis, which is where a lot of this work comes from, a lot of the uh, sort of data that was entered into this is looking at word greater than pseudo word activity, which and and, and also effects of frequency, um, which both show up in this region. And from some, from some cognitive models, that would be a measure of semantics, but from other cognitive models, those would be the properties that you'd expect of orthographic representations and not of semantic representations. And so we get to this problem of interpreting what these, what these functions, what these activations actually mean. So is the angular gyrus orthographic or semantic? We do the exact same analysis that we did before, except now we're using the angular gyrus as the ROI. And here we see that the left angular gyrus is showing orthographic similarity, not visual similarity, not significant amounts of semantic similarity, and the right angular gyrus isn't showing anything. And so in this way, cognitive, we can use our cognitive theories to help inform sort of our neural models of what's going on in reading in the brain, because we can now get some novel insights into the cognitive functions associated with different brain regions like the left visual word form area is doing orthographic processing, but not visual processing, and maybe a little bit of semantics. And the left angular gyrus is doing orthographic processing, but not semantic processing in the context of reading. We've also shown that it's, uh, yeah. Okay, so um, there's other people that have used this technique as well. Um, so we're, I don't wanna claim that we're the only people that are doing RSA in reading tasks, and those papers are cited here, and they're really excellent and worth, um, worth looking at as well. Okay, so the, I, um, the, one of the things I really wanna talk about to this group is how we can think about not just the organization of reading in sort of the unimpaired brain, but also the reorganization of reading using the same tool to map the reorganization reading of reading following brain damage. And so it is the case that brain damage uh, results in reading impairments. And so damage to the regions that are described, also damage to a bunch of different regions can lead patients with a severe inability to read immediately after the stroke. And those severe impairments in reading often resolve during the transition from acute to chronic stroke. So you often get improvements uh, during this transition. And so this um, has been, this spontaneous recovery has been taken as evidence of the fact that we have neural plasticity of reading, that the damaged brain is able to uh, reorganize to better support impaired reading functions. And um, the talk next week is going to talk in much more detail and at a much greater, you know, the world leading expert in thinking about um, how this reorganization can happen. But the same kinds of questions that come up with reorganization of other types of, of language um, come up here as well, which is, is the reorganization happening paralesionally? Is it happening contralesionally? Does it depend on where the stroke is? Does it depend on sort of when you are in the process of recovery? All of those questions can come up here. And you, you can use fMRI as a tool for investigating neuroplasticity. So you actually can then see where are there changes in the neural response uh, following stroke. And you see increases, like you see with other aspects of language processing, you see increases in paralesional and contralesional activation relative to control subjects. There's actually been, um, very few studies that have focused on this in reading, and so mostly they're case studies. But what I'm showing here on the left is kind of that visual word form area. And on the right are two case studies that have been reported, two really compelling case studies that have been reported in the literature, where you actually have tumor resections that damage the visual word form area. And then these patients undergo the same kinds of reading studies to see now what parts of the brain are activated when these patients are reading. And you can see that there's kind of contralesional activation, and then also some paralegional activation in both of these patients and in other patients that have been reported in the literature. 
Okay, so it would be really great to think that what these shifts in activation mean is a reorganization of a cognitive function to a different region. That's frequently how you see this sort of uh, kind of fMRI-based neuroplasticity, these activation-based neuroplasticity um, uh, things interpreted. But of course, you can't know that that's what's happening. There's a bunch of alternative interpretations that could be going on. It could reflect different strategies for word reading. So it could be revealing that, say, the right hemisphere had some capability of doing word reading poorly. And in healthy undergraduates, you don't get that region to be too activated because you're mostly doing it through kind of the left hemisphere region. But once you have that left hemisphere region damaged, now this other thing, which exists in all humans, is starting to be activated more with these patients. It could be the fact that reading is really hard for these patients, and so it requires other functions like working memory that um, are, aren't really related to reading recovery, but are just now other functions that are coming on that have these different regions that are getting activated. It might be this function that contributes to impairment. I don't haven't seen this proposed in the reading literature, but certainly this is something that people talk about in the in the, the speech production literature of what right hemisphere activations might mean. And of course. This could be different depending on whether we're talking about paralegional or contralegional regions or what part of the brain is damaged. There's so many different ways to think about what these things could mean. So um, the point here is that it's just really difficult to interpret the relationship between these activation changes and the reorganization of cognitive function. So why does that matter? Well, I think that what we really care about is um, I think it's really important to see the what regions are upregulating and downregulating during the course of recovery. I think that's that is an important goal, and we see that there's um, uh, a, a lot of work that gets done there. And I think it's useful to kind of understand at this brain level just which regions are changing their their function and how those changes in function might relate to kind of the success of recovery. I think there's a lot of really important work that can be done strictly looking at the brain level. But, off, but we also probably want to think about things at the cognitive level as well. But we want to be able to think about what I, for lack of a better word, have called cognitive neuroplasticity, which is what do the observed brain changes mean regarding the cognitive systems of these brain damaged patients? How has the sort of mapping between cognition, levels of representation and cognition, and the neural system changed as a result of this uh, recovery? And there's lots of different things that cognitive neuroplasticity that could be happening with cognitive neuroplasticity. And it's worth trying to develop some methods to kind of work out which of these things is actually happening because it's really, you know, it, it's going to have some impact on what we think about recovery as actually being and how we might think about using the neuroimaging data to help inform our theories of how to recover. And so I'm going to just do this very toy example um, to kind of walk through different ideas about what cognitive neuroplasticity could mean. And so here is the bottom of a brain. We have three regions labeled on them. They both have colors, which are about the cognitive function that normally resides in that region. And they have letters, which are like the name of that brain region. And so the cognitive functions, this is like totally toy. We're going to call the red region reading, the, the purple reading region semantics, and the, blue, the green region face recognition. And um, I'm not wedded to those in any way, but they're just going to help serve an illustration. So the question is, what happens when you wipe out region X? So what happens in terms of cognitive function when you wipe out region X, with a, when region X gets wiped out with a stroke? And so one possibility is that it's simple subtraction. And so one possibility is that all that's happened is that you've lost function X and that everything else is sort of working in the way that it normally works in the brain. And you see this upregulation in maybe region Z and region Y because you see a shift in strategy, for example, but a shift in strategy that's using existing functions. And those other functions are just unchanged. That's one thing that could be happening from a cognitive perspective that could explain the changes in brain activity, um, but not say that there's any real changes in cognitive in the cognitive functions that underlie that brain activity. You could also imagine that um, you get a shift of this red function, this reading function, to both region Z and region Y, maybe both, um, or, or maybe either one. And so I'm gonna, I call this no-cost functional takeover because in this case, you're getting a shift in function. So you're getting this upregulation in both region Z and region Y because now they're doing the thing that region X used to be doing. 
But actually, the other functions in that region haven't changed. And so you're just going to get this thing to move there without any you know, impact on, on what normally gets done, on the semantic processing or the face recognition processing that's going on in these regions. This has, of course, some consequences for the way that we draw inferences about brain, about cognitive processing and neural cognitive and neural processing from lesion brains. So it has some real consequences for the way that we think about lesion symptom mapping, because what we're going to find is in the normal, in the healthy brain, um, we see that what we should be seeing is that only region X has a strong associated association with whether or not you can read. But we're going to lose some of that strong association because there's going to be a bunch of people who've lost region X, but have recovered the ability to read because that reading ability has now shifted to a different part of the brain. And so no matter how we try to measure that reading ability, because it's the sort of exact same function that shifted to some other part of the brain, we're going to get a weaker effect in our VLSM. But of course, brain, it's not like there's sort of an infinite amount of resource of brain. This sort of neurons in region Z and region Y are kind of plugging away, doing some other function. And so it, it seems like another really important possibility to consider is that there's um, not no cost functional takeover, but actually some zero sum functional takeover. So you get the reading function to move to both Z, region Z and region Y at some cost to the functions that normally are carried out in those regions. And so you're now still getting the upregulation of Z and Y in these reading tasks because of the shift in function, but you're actually getting other functional impairments, um, not because of the lesion itself, but because of some sort of um, distal effects of how this lesion affects other, uh, other functions during the course of recovery. And so one way to think about this is to, to rethink about some work, uh, some really great and important work by Marlene Berman and David Plout, which looked at patients who had damage to really either region X or region Z, so damage to the visual, to the left mid fusiform gyrus or the right mid fusiform gyrus, where what I'm showing you here in this toy graph, this is not their data, is that patients with the left mid fusiform damage tend to um, lose the ability to read. Patients with right mid fusiform damage tend to lose the ability to process faces. If you also then test those same patients on their ability, you know, on their ability, if you test all the patients on both their ability to read and see faces, you actually see that those left hemisphere patients are a little bit impaired on faces and those right hemisphere patients are a little bit impaired on reading but noticeably impaired relative to control. And so uh, Berman and Plout interpret this as saying that the sort of idea of the modularity of these functions is, is not really uh, correct, that instead you see that these functions are, um, are more distributed across these different parts of cortex with some slight specialization for reading the left and faces in the right. An alternative interpretation of that is that we've seen some example of zero sum functional takeover where reading, the fact that you're at 40% reading means that you've recovered some amount of your reading into the right hemisphere at the cost of the normal face processing that's going on in that region. And then the last possibility and the one that I don't even know how to think about is that you get these totally new cognitive functions. Oops, this is labeled wrong. So you get these totally new cognitive functions um, that have nothing to do with how the brain normally processes information. That makes drawing any inferences from patients really hard. Luckily, the fact that we mostly seem to be able to draw useful inferences from patient data that then we get converging evidence from other approaches, it seems unlikely that this is what's going on. Okay, so now to just go back to what I, the RSA stuff. So we can, the, what seems to me now critical to think about is not just is this region activated, but what cognitive function is reflected by this activation? And again, we can use representational similarity analysis to decode the function in the way that we did with the undergraduates. And so, as I said, we right now, we just have a single case study of this one patient who had a hemorrhagic stroke. Um, he was tested five years after a stroke. Even five years after a stroke, he still had a severe reading and writing impairment, though it was improved relative to how he was immediately after a stroke, and he especially was able to read short words and high-frequency words with some consistency. He was given the same fMRI experiment as before, and so we're going to, uh, and so the question now becomes is where does this patient show changes in cognitive function compared to control? And so the first thing to show is that doing simple activation-based uh, analyses, we find again that he's showing more activation 
contralesionally and paralesionally and in a bunch of other parts of the brain. But we're not actually interested so much in this activation-based approach. We're more interested in how representational similarity can help us. And so the first question we have is, um, what do unimpaired readers do with the part of the brain that's damaged in CH? So is it the case that he's lost this part of the brain that seems to be really critical for reading in, in our sort of in our control population. And so we have 20 underimpaired readers. We have ROIs that are defined by warping his lesion into their native space. And when we do the similarity analysis, we see that this region seems to be involved in orthographic processing. There's a correlation between the brain-based patterns in this region with orthography and also with visual processing. And so it doesn't, it's not surprising then that he lost the ability to read following damage to this region because this is a part of the brain that we anticipate was doing reading related processes prior to his stroke. And so then we can ask, I'm just gonna focus here for a sake of time on contralesional stuff, but we can also do the same thing paralesionally. And so we can ask, does the orthographic function shift contralesionally? Does it, is the right hemisphere now taking over that function that was lost in the left hemisphere? And I'm gonna focus again on the BWFA and the angular gyrus because actually his stroke includes extensive damage to both of those regions in the left hemisphere. And so we can ask, is his right hemisphere now doing more orthographic processing? And controls. And so this is how it's going to work. So um, I'm going to plot, what's being plotted here is the control data. I'm focusing here on orthographic and visual processing. And for each participant, I'm focusing on the difference between their orthographic processing and their visual processing, just to kind of limit the amount of data that we're looking at at any given moment. And then this is a box plot showing the range of all the control participants, so we can really see where CH falls. And so we can see that in the left visual word form area, there is a tendency of participants to show more orthographic than visual processing. And in the right visual word form area, there's a tendency to show more visual than orthographic processing. For CH in the right hemisphere, he shows more orthographic than visual processing. And the same thing is true in the angular gyrus. So the control participants show a tendency for orthographic processing in the left angular gyrus, but nothing in the right angular gyrus, but CH shows more activation in the right angular. And so this suggests that we've seen some evidence of cognitive neuroplasticity, that the right hemisphere, uh, beat up, the right hemisphere homolog of the visual word form area in the angular gyrus at least can change their cognitive function following brain damage, where the change in the cognitive function, the new function that's being supported, is that left hemisphere function in the undamaged brain. However, it's worth noting that CH hasn't fully recovered the ability to read, and so it seems like this functional change has not fully supported the ability to recover, um, to recover reading. So we're doing a much larger study now, thanks to the NIH, um, with more patients and better controls. And the data, as I said, is currently being analyzed. And so stay tuned for what this result looks like beyond just this single subject. So then the last thing I just wanna end with mentioning that we can do is also think about how neural data can be used to inform cognitive theories. And so there's been all sorts of types of debates in the cognitive literature about the nature of the orthographic code and sort of various aspects of what we think are going on as we're doing these mappings in, in, within cognitive processing. And the goal is to see whether we can actually use neural data to address some of these things. And so we're doing a bunch of stuff in this arena. So one thing that we're looking at is trying to think about um, how uh, letter order and letter position is represented at different levels of representation in early parts, the sort of what, what people in the cognitive literature call the front end of visual word recognition. This goes back to what Dirk alluded to. Many of my, much of my work has been interested in sequence processing and sequence processing as it involves letter sequence processing in reading and writing. And so we can apply that same stuff that we've done with uh, healthy undergraduates and with, uh, with neuropsychological case studies looking at behavior, we can now do that same thing um, with, with fMRI. We're in the process of designing those studies. We've also been really interested in individual differences in cognitive reading processes and thinking about how, whether sort of the things that we're seeing are consistent across the whole population or whether there's sort of different types of readers that can be picked up with this RSA analysis. We published on that a couple of years ago. We've been doing a study looking at how the reading task you're doing, sort of what are you reading for? Are you reading for thinking about pronunciation or are you reading for thinking about meaning? How does that impact 
kind of what the RSA tells us about the, the neural processes of reading in these different regions. And then we're also looking at sort of more kind of like psycholinguistic questions on sort of the, the levels of morphological processing during reading. This is work that we're doing with, I'm doing with Kathy Russell and Claire Lally at Royal Holloway and a bunch of other things in this space. And so just to summarize um, uh, sort of the talk, since I'm, I'm, I'm at the end of, of what I want to say, um, uh, so the, 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 main, the main takeaway is to think about how useful representational similarity analysis is at addressing these questions about the links between cognition and, and cognitive neuroscience. And so cognitive models are predicting representational similarity structure between words, between all sorts of things that we're able to think about. Um, we can also analyze representational similarity structure in neural data. And so therefore this technique of representational similarity analysis can provide a bridge between cognitive and neural theories of reading. And I've shown how we can use this as a tool for evaluating the function of brain regions vis-a-vis -vis computational, computationally explicit cognitive theories. I've also talked about how we can use this as a tool for understanding the neural reorganization of cognitive function following damage. And then also about how we're doing some work to use fMRI data to inform theories of cognition. And the focus today has been on reading and its recovery. So evidence for orthographic processing in the visual word form area and left angular gyrus during reading tasks, evidence that orthographic processing can shift to the right hemisphere following damage to the left hemisphere reading network. But it doesn't have to only be done in reading. I think that there's lots of really interesting things that can be done using this technique to map the organization and reorganization of other language functions. For example, the reorganization of semantics versus phonological processing in patients who have language production difficulties, or even maybe like thinking about phonological versus like articulatory and motor processes in patients where it's hard to distinguish kind of how, how they're able to recover their, their language process. And so I think there's a lot of power in using this technique to do this bridging, especially in the context of the focus of the seminar series, which is aphasia of recovery. How do we sort of understanding the neural correlates of aphasia of recovery? And I also think that this is really good for cognitive science as a whole, because an ideal model that I think we should have for what cognitive science should be is we should think about all of these types of approaches to thinking about how the mind works as being good and useful and informative of each other. So we have cognitive models that can inform neural theories, and we have neural data that can enrich cognitive models. And when we do that, we can have better we can use both cognitive models and neural data to be able to inform our theories of damage and its recovery. And so with that, I want to thank you for having me um, do this remote uh, presentation. It was really, as I said, an honor to, to talk to you all. And then also all of the people that did you know, the bulk of this work um, and, supported, and supported the work that we've done. So thanks very much. Okay, great. This is Dirk and Aaron again. Thanks so much for a, a really nice and, and clear and inspiring talk. Normally you would now be hearing applause, but for now you'll just have to imagine 64 homes across the globe erupting in applause <laughs> for you, okay? Okay, so the first question is from Dirk, um, which is how consistent is the activation pattern between repetitions of the same item? And that's an excellent question and um, we haven't looked at it that a ton in the old data that we had. We've started to look at it more and look at it more in our new data. It's pretty noisy at the level of a single repetition. And so uh, you can use that as a tool actually to um, see kind of what the maximum of the similarity might be expected to be. And so you might notice, for example, that um, the the correlations that I'm talking about are really low. They're like 0 0.01, 0 0.02. When you actually look at just how correlated each repetition is to itself compared to other things, you end up seeing um, uh, you end up seeing that it's it's not super strongly correlated, but it's consistent enough if you have enough repetitions to be able to get something that's that's reasonable. We're interested in trying to figure out how to what sort of the minimum number of repetitions is that we can start to have reasonable data, but I don't think we have a good answer to that. Okay, the next question is from Million Machin. So the question is, it looks like the angular gyrus region you've analyzed is superior to activations that have typically been associated with semantic processing. There's also have been proposals that the angular gyrus should be divided into superior anterior, inferior pro posterior divisions. Would you expect to see semantic similarity but not visual in inferior posterior 
angular gyrus and orthographic similarity, but not semantic in superior anterior angular gyrus. We, uh, yeah, probably, yes. So probably the angular gyrus is a really big region. And so it's probably the case that, um, that the region that we're looking at might not be, we've heard, we've heard this critique before, and I think it's a reasonable one, that there might be a region that's very close to the angular, what we've used as our angular gyrus ROI that maybe has more semantic processing. Um, and the one that we're picking up happens to be more orthographic processing. Um, we did try to run sort of smaller searchlights in the area around the angular gyrus and weren't able to find anything that was um, related to semantic similarity, but we haven't looked at that too extensively. So there might be something in that general vicinity that is doing semantic processing, but there is also this part of the angular gyrus that is, is definitely doing orthographic processing. Okay, and then... Oh, it's so fun, all these people who are asking questions. I had no idea you were here. Heather Pyle um, asked, uh, uh, did you look at areas outside of the Angular Diaries and the VWFA in the 2017 paper? Uh, we didn't. So were there regions that were strongly related to semantic processing besides the VWFA? Um, we have since looked at that a little bit. Um, we, we, we didn't want to kind of Gen we wanted to start this by looking at some specific areas that we had a priori hypotheses for, but we've gone back and analyzed some of the data um, in collaboration with other people. And so we've worked a little bit um, uh, with people at uh, BCBL in San Sebastian where they were looking at semantic processing in the hippocampus. And so we pulled out hippocampal ROIs and they had, I don't, it's been a while since I've looked at this, but they had different regions within the hippocampus that they thought might be more involved in semantic processing uh, based on activation-based stuff. And so we used two data sets to look at um, semantic processing in those regions, and we found the same region. So there were regions of the hippocampus that were correlating pretty strongly with semantic similarity. Um, I don't recall looking at other regions that have shown that, though in the 2018 paper, we do find a bunch of other, oh yeah, in the 2018 paper, which involved reading aloud and not um, and not this other kind of detection task, we did look at other regions, and I don't remember which ones we found were um, were related to semantic processing. Sorry, sorry for not remembering. Um, Dirk asks, um, what about more general cognitive functions abilities that might underlie orthographic and/or phonological analysis, such as sequencing? Um, could my data say anything about that? Um, so I am interested in sequencing and I am interested in the extent to which um, there's some sort of general capacities for maintaining the order of things that might be applied in both kind of language and, and, and non-language things. We've done some work on it. What I've shown so far can't really tell us anything about that because I've only looked at one function. I've only looked at reading. Um, we do have neuropsychological data that shows that we have these patients who have, we identify as having order processing deficits in uh, verbal working memory. And then we show that in both writing and in speaking, they're making like an inordinate amount of transposition errors with phonemes or letters, much more than would be expected by chance and much more than other patients who don't show this order processing deficit. So I do think that there is some evidence of general cognitive functions that underlie um, our sequencing as sort of a general cognitive function that supports language production um, and process, possibly language comprehension in both orthographic and phonological ways. I don't think that the data that I presented actually can speak to that that much. I was thinking in a in a, in, in a in a in a perhaps more simple way, you might hypothesize that both orthographic and the phonological analysis in your present in the words that you present involves some type of sequencing so if um for words that are correlated at both ends right so both orthographically and phonologically you might say that's what they're sharing uh, of course the issue the, the the problem with that is that they also share other components so but that was where my question came from yeah i mean i think that's really interesting so i think there's i, I so I, I truly don't think so yeah so we, it's true that we have sort of phonological measures and and so and orthographic measures here and so it's possible that we could then look back at the data that we have to see whether there's a a, a similarity in how um 
how things are are kind of ordered, the order of representations. And people have done this work actually. So, so people have done this work with Dennis Norris. Uh, sorry, people have done this work with RSA. So Dennis Norris um, has done a bunch of work doing RSA with verbal and nonverbal working memory to see kind of whether you can pull out a, a sort of an abstract representation of order that's independent of the items that are being ordered and sort of where that order process is being carried out and whether it's the same for different types of sequences. And so you certainly could use RSA to do that. And it might even be the case that the data that we have would allow us to do that. But um, but I'm having a hard time thinking about how we would actually how we would actually do that analysis. Uh, Kirana asks, um, excellent work. But thank you, Kirana. Um, and so uh, uh, is if an area is both orthographic and semantic, could that be interpreted as integration as an integration area? Um, the angular gy gyrus has been claimed to be one such area. Um, and so uh, and you show also showed it significant for both orthographic and semantic similarity. I actually only showed that it was significant for orthographic similarity and not for semantic similarity. It was the BWFA that I showed was significant for both. Um, I don't quite know what is meant by an integration area, so I have a hard time interpreting, knowing how to interpret that. Um, it might have something to do with sort of the inter the interactive activation theory, though, where there's feedback from these other from different levels that are sort of converging in the same place in some ways. So there's multiple types of information that are are sort of being reflected in the activation of this region, um, and so uh, I think what becomes critical then is to understand the time course of when these different types of information are coming in. And so if it's an integrator where it's getting sort of both orthographic and semantic information, and then they're they're being combined together, you might expect them to sort of show up in this region at the same time. If it's a region that's sort of shifting its function from orthographic to semantics via kind of like top-down feedback where you're getting sort of a reshaping from of this region by semantic information, you might see that First orthographic stuff comes on, then semantic stuff comes on later. So hopefully the MEG data that we've collected and haven't analyzed will be able to address that to some extent. Um, and then Peter, uh, Peter Haggard asked, um, why would it not more strongly recruit the other orthographic region um, in the reorganization? Uh, so why don't you see it in the left, um, the, the left angular gyrus? So this patient actually, the lesion, the hemorrhagic lesion was really enormous and extended, included much of the left angular gyrus and the visual word form area. And so it will be interesting to look at the patients that we have uh, in the larger study to see whether that is the case, whether you see this uh, sort of paralesional reorganization that's more effective because you can do this reorganization into one of these other regions, but in the case where both of them are damaged, you have to do this sort of contralesional reorganization and it's less effective. And so that might be what we eventually see. I, as I say, we don't have that data yet, but in this case, there wasn't a possibility to recruit that other orthographic region because it was also damaged. Can I ask a follow up a little, because uh, I understood this after I asked my question when you talked about the patient. The general point being you find two areas that are related to orthographic processing. Are you thinking they're doing exactly the same? Yeah. Can you use RSA to uh, dissociate their different roles in orthographic processing? And if they're doing the same, it's a kind of degeneracy case where it might, it might be the case that, and this is known from neuropsychological cases, that if the lesion is restricted to one of these areas, your reading impairment is not there or reduced. Yeah, so my guess is that they're not the same. So my guess is that there, there's so, or so if you go back to like the big cognitive model that I put up early on that has a million levels of representation, there's actually a number of these levels that are what I would call orthographic levels. And so maybe the clearest is both the orthographic lexicon and this level of abstract letter identity representation. Both of them are sort of pattern show orthographic similarity structures. And so figuring out how to distinguish those with um, RSA alone, it's probably gonna be very difficult to do, but there might be other things you can do, like see which region is tracking frequency, word frequency, for example, where if a region shows orthographic similarity and it tracks word frequency, then it's probably an orthographic lexicon. 
if it shows orthographic similarity and it's not tracking frequency, then it's probably a level of, of abstract letter identity. But my guess is that they represent different orthograph different types of orthographic processing within this within the cognitive system. Okay, but I don't thanks. Know. Thanks for a yeah. great talk. Yeah, thanks so much, Peter. Um, okay, and then um, uh, Jason asked if I can talk about what has been found as it relates to letter position coding in the brain. So what I've done, uh, I've done previous work that's behavioral either with patients or with, um, with undergraduates. And what we found is that letter position is represented um, by a distance from both the beginning and the end of the word by, and sorry, there's a really loud noise behind me. I hope this isn't too disrupting. Um, but um, we haven't yet designed the study. So we're in the process of trying to figure out how we can design the materials to be able to, to ask that level of question um, with the with RSA. And so I don't really have anything to say about that at this point, but I'm looking forward. To, I mean, that should be a couple of years out. That's sort of one of the next studies that we have uh, ready to go once we actually are allowed to collect fMRI data again. And then uh, JP asked whether um, functional localizers play a role. And so, um, yeah, we've started to do that. And so the more recent studies, instead of just using um, anatomical regions of interest, we run visual word form area localizers. Um, we also, because we've been interested in the relationship between reading and writing, we've also run some Exner area ROIs, and it seems to be helpful to be able to use these functional localizers um, instead of just doing anatomical localizers. And so, um, again, that data is forthcoming, um, but uh, that's that I think is an important uh, an important step to move forward um, to to do this work better. And um, those are all the questions that I've gotten to the end of the questions. So thank you very much for listening.